Aha, the glitz, the glamour, we are talking round table. Well, to a certain extent we are. We're also talking about the megawatt stars and the gleaming gold statues that are given out on Oscars night. But this weekend the award show hasn't even been able to find a proper host and the debates around Me Too and diversity simply aren't going away. With millions glued to streaming services such as Netflix, we wonder if Hollywood, as we know it, is doomed. And a very warm welcome to the programme with me, David Foster. The golden age of Hollywood, it sort of lasted from the end of the silent era in American cinema around about the late 1920s until the early 1960s when audiences were more interested, we sort of think, in the storylines on screen than an actor's doings off it. And now the bad guy comes in the form of streaming services. Who's going to ride to the rescue of the silver screen? It's Oscars week, a time to celebrate the good and the great of the silver screen. But today's movie industry paints a very different picture to that of its 20th century golden era. From the Me Too movement to diversity issues and a shift in consumer tastes, Hollywood has seen a turbulent few years. Streaming services such as Netflix and HBO are not only taking their audience, they're also taking the stars, many of whom are choosing the smaller screen. Netflix created around 700 original shows and movies in 2018, about 100 more than US studios. It also has a wide global reach, quickly approaching 150 million subscribers. Can Hollywood adapt and survive, or is the traditional movie industry out of date and out of time? And I'm very pleased to say that joining me at the round table, we have the film critic Christopher Hooten. We have Aqua Jamfi, journalist and founder of the British Blacklist. That's an online talent agency, Gabriella Geisinger's with us, arts and culture journalist. So let's begin with the same question to each one of you. Gabriella, let me start with you first of all. What has changed? Well, you've got a lot of different factors, I think, that are constantly changing in Hollywood. Um, you have the stories that are being told, who's telling them and who's receiving them, and how. So we've seen an evolution in a diversification of the stories being told and who's telling them, which I think is only a good thing. Um, and then with the introduction of streaming services, that's changing how films are being made and also how we're watching them. We may not be going to the cinemas as often, but instead watching from the comfort of our own homes, which can change the impact of a movie. So I think those are all different factors that coexist in the evolution Studios of Hollywood. Studios are only there really to make money. I mean, they're not there for altruistic reasons. Can they carry on making money if there's been this change? I think there used to be people in the studio system who had uh, loftier goals, who wanted to also try and make some art while they're at it, but maybe that's eroded somewhat and now it's more of a, a money-making thing, when it comes to the cinema anyway. I think people that people were going to cinemas for a certain type of, type of film now, whereas there's other kinds that they'll say, I'll just catch that when I'm at home, and that's causing a big shift. Am I right in thinking that Hollywood these days is concentrating on the big blockbusters, the ones that can become franchises and the streaming services are sort of saying, well, look, we can throw 20 million rather than 200 million at that movie. So they're sort of uh, smaller budget, mid-budget stuff that we're going to see on the streaming services and Hollywood is going for the, you know, the, the, the big crescendo still. Yeah, we've kind of seen the disappearance of mid-budget, essentially. So now you're just kind of left with huge, huge tempo films that tend to be action and superhero-oriented. Tentpole? You mean by that something that's held up as, like, the big top? Yeah, the, 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 flag, the flag, flagship, the flagship films that they, they'll yeah. spend, like, 300 million on and, and see a return in the billions. Is that, and then there's, you know, the small indies working on, you know, one million budgets, and that kind of... A lot of the stuff in between doesn't get made anymore. So they're sort of gambling on an all-or-nothing situation here, aren't they? They're saying, look, we're going to throw a massive amount of money at the, this idea because we hope it'll work. And what, what if it doesn't? Where, does it, where, where do they get their future from? I mean, I think... I don't know. I think um, Hollywood's actually having a pause, even though they're, they're churning out what makes their money that they know is going to give them a return. But they're also trying to think, well, how do we capture this other stuff because the audiences are reacting, the audiences are going elsewhere because Hollywood's time and time ignored them and that's from diversity down to just people are tired of the same old franchises and the superhero movies, not everyone likes those films. So if their audiences are turning away, what do we do with this, this, this 
this this gap in the middle, yeah. as, as it have, were. Have they got an answer? Um, it's really hard because I'm not a Hollywood person. I, I don't know what their answer is at the moment, to be honest. I think they're trying to work it out and I think... Um, but then also I feel like there are quite a few people who are stuck in the old guard, like, this is Hollywood, this is how it runs. And it's... It, I don't know, I think the, the new platforms are pushing Hollywood, but it's about changing the people at the top as well. We'll talk about diversity, which is something that you've mm. worked hard on, of, of course, during the course of this programme. But you are an industry... You, you know about the industry. Sure. Not specifically Hollywood. But let me ask you about the new type of industry that's come along. What are the streaming services perhaps doing that Hollywood is now thinking we should have done? The streaming services are reacting to the audiences who have been complaining, or not complaining, have been protesting and talking about the lack of representation on screen screen and it's it's hard to avoid diversity in that respect no, bring it but in it is time. diversity yeah. in regards not even just black or white or gender or sexuality it's just generally a diverse telling of stories there are so many different people that don't get their stories on screen so um or seeing themselves represented so the best thing what the streaming services are doing are saying okay these audiences want to be served they're actually paying for subscription services they're paying like their money a month they're not necessarily paying all that money to go to the cinema because taking a family to the cinema these days is a bit of a wage packet so let's have family night at home and watch something that's going to suit everybody we paid it for a month get in the snacks that we want for our you know cost prices and then we're getting to see something that represents us so the streaming services are listening to audiences who are saying we're not being represented and is, is this where it all came from that somebody out there was shouting and they felt they my audience was, was shouting in the wilderness, in the dark, and somebody finally realised that they should listen, and that somebody being the streaming services. Well, I think streaming services maybe take less of a risk, you know, if they're not putting as much money behind, they're not spending three, you know, 300 million, whatever it is, on these massive movies. They can have a smaller movie, put it out on a streaming service, and see, it's a test ground, sure. see how people respond to it. And... Like we were saying, there is that audience there, and they're waiting for these stories to be told where they see themselves. And I think the streaming sites have a, a unique ability to reach people directly in a way that you don't have to make the effort or necessarily have the monetary stability to go to the cinema, which, as you were saying, is a huge expense now. I, I, I was going to ask you, any one of you, if you could come up with examples. And I suppose the one that I'm thinking of here that's doing so well at the moment, and we'll see after the Oscar ceremony whether, in fact, it's one best picture, is a Netflix film called Roma. And you, mm -hmm. you would not think that a black-and-white film in Spanish with English subtitles would have a hope in any other environment. Is that the sort of thing you're thinking about? Chris, Christopher, do any time. Rome is an interesting one because I think it's it's a, it's a beautiful film and it's, it's old fashioned in, in in the way it's put together um, and there's a lot of admiration for it. And but I didn't expect it to when I thought I thought A Star Is Born would 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 probably win. But now I don't necessarily think it will. But that that's a it's a perfect signal because A Star Is Born is a very old school Hollywood type film. Obviously, it's been remade two or three times um, where. It, and it seemed like a shoe in but it almost the, the shift to, to Roma suggests that Hollywood is going through this change and that it's going to favour those kind of movies more. Think, think of other ones that we might know of that have done well on Netflix that would never have seen the light of day el elsewhere. Sort of indie films, if you like. I mean, La La Land was almost one of those, wasn't it? I mean, it, it, I wasn't, it wasn't a Hollywood film. It was Summit uh, Entertainment. Or the, the, one, the big one that jumps, springs to mind that was interesting was the, the Moonlight winning Best Picture, which is obviously it wasn't a Netflix film, but was a, a film with a way smaller budget than you'd usually mm. expect for um, a big Hollywood film. So it was interesting that, that that took the crown that year. And diversity. We'll, we'll go into it in detail, if we may, just to finish off. We're seeing a change there, do you think? Yeah, well, and one thing I think you, you mentioned in the intro that Netflix is, you know, seen as the baddie, but I actually think it, it's often a force for good, really. And Not by us. Yeah. I was suggesting it was seen it's, as yeah, the one yeah, that no, might course, shoot yeah, they, down. Yeah. But the I, one I who's think, been the sheriff in the town for all these years, and that is Hollywood, yeah, I don't but, think. But, I mean, it, you know, it has the, it's able to take more risks, I think. You've seen a lot of studios kind of have a, have a flop with a, an indie-ish sort of film or a more artistic film and then be like, right, we need to crank out a franchise movie, whereas Netflix can has the, the budget and the personnel to kind of take well, more risks. A good example is Annihilation. So Annihilation had a cinematic run in America, but the studio was not sold on it doing well in, in the European market, so instead it was released to Netflix. And you, you look at Annihilation, it's a sci-fi movie to start with. It is a team of elite military and scientific people, and they all happen to be women, and they all are diverse, um, and that's the kind of movie that all of a sudden does really well on Netflix. 
the studio, not necessarily banking on people going to the cinema, making that effort to go see it in the cinema. Meanwhile, you know, I was thrilled when Annihilation came onto Netflix. It was one of, I watched it within, I think, hours of it launching on the streaming yeah. site because it was such a, it, a wonderful time to see women of all different backgrounds, different sexualities, engaging in a tale that's typically told by men for men. And women are meant to go along. I'm assuming it's, it's about people getting wiped out. Uh, it's a, <laughs> uh, it's a little more complicated well, I mean, than the, that. the title sort of gives a little bit of Yeah, it, it's it? about a, a, a kind of like a Bermuda Triangle location where nature is changing and, and evolution is going in this weird split and people can't quite figure out why. But, but are the women the shoot them down uh, They are there. Types? No, uh, in, in a certain way. They're there to, it's a, a few scientists and some military people going in to figure out what's going on in this area. So some of them, yes, are there to defend so with guns and some of them are there as the nerdy science geeks. Okay, okay, okay. I was going to throw in Mudbound, which is a Netflix film that was... was um, Mudbound? Mudbound. So basically, it's a film about a sharecropping family who... A black family and their relationship with a white family that buys their land. And in that, um, a young director, Dee Ree, she's quite a new director. Mm. It's a Netflix film, but it got recognised, I think, it had a cin cinematography nomination at lo two years ago at the Oscars. So this is a type of film that na a studio might not have picked up. Are you, are you finding with um, Blacklist Britain... Uh, Britain Blacklist. British Blacklist. British Blacklist. Are you finding that more of your talent are getting tapped up because there's more opportunity? So le let me just clarify, it's an online platform that celebrates British Blacklist talent in the arts. So it's a news platform and we have a database of talent. Yeah. So I'm not exactly an agency just yet. It's just more like connecting the mainstream with talent because of this, you know, this lack of visibility for talent. And yes, there's been quite a lot of, you know, the stories have been told that a lot of British Black talent are going to America to get more opportunities because over here they're still not recognised, they're not recognised in that on their home ground. Um, but this is also feeding into the whole thing of studios not recognising smaller or diverse stories or having, letting people of colour tell their stories in a way that's not controlled by the studios and, and then dictating how the black narratives should go. So this is where streaming platforms are actually taking on stories. You're getting more smaller pockets, like you had something like She's Gotta Have It, Spike Lee's series was breaking down, um, we had Dear White People, we've got um, Top Boy coming to Netflix, which is a British um, series that was on Channel 4, and now it's going to Netflix. So there's these, they're recognising that people want to see themselves. So yes, British black talent are... Uh, uh, we guess, were talking about... Uh, yeah. Sorry, Chris. I was going to say, I guess what, what we're seeing is sort of like the decentralisation of Hollywood, really. Yeah. So, um, and then Netflix are just uh, going to more and more territories. They've just started making originals in Africa for the first time. Um, so they're just looking around the world for more places to tell stories, which can only be a good thing. If there are more opportunities uh, for actors, diverse actors, want to call them whatever you want, but, but you know, people have found it difficult to get work up until now. Is that because somebody has a collective conscious in conscience in all of this, or because somebody's suddenly realising that there's box office out there? Yeah, I think it would be too charitable to say that they've just, all the big studios have just <laughs> stepped back and yeah. listened and been like, we, should, yeah. we have a responsibility to do this. I think, mm. to, to some extent, they, a lot of the big action films, a few of them were flops, and now I think part of it was, was business logic was just purely, we've told a lot of the same kinds of stories about white superheroes, let's try something else. Um, and it's, well, in terms of Black Panther anyway, it paid off for them, so I think they'll continue down that route. And also Wonder Woman for women. Yeah. One, and we also had, like, Kevin Hart is like, kind of like the poster boy for a black lead actor making millions at the box office. So it is always about money. It's and, of course, there's his time with the Oscars or not. Exactly. It, it kind of... Was he, was he saying something that was useful for diversity, in, in a Who, sense? Kevin Hart? By pulling out. No, that was his own... <laughs> it was, it was you reckon that was, just being stupid? No, I don't even... I think he did what he did, and I think that's his decision. I, I don't think he's... He's not um, the benchmark of diversity or representation. He did what he did. He said what he said. He did apologise in his own way back then. The Oscars, I think it was a weird thing to ask him and not know what he'd done before. He, they know his history of comedic... Yeah risqueness. Um, him pulling out is it was his own deci decision. I don't think it's um, right or wrong. I, I really I don't really care that much. Um, I think it's interesting for it going ahead without um, a host. But I think also uh, the Oscars is is the end end result. It's the, the they need the Oscar survives on what's being made, right? So it needs films. To, and when when you look so. at what's coming up uh, at the ceremony uh, compared to what there might have been twenty years ago. Yeah. Do you think things have changed hugely for, for the type of people that you write about and represent? 
Uh, yeah, I think it, it, de it depends because um, this year, what, Spike Lee's getting his first director's nomination in 30 years. And, you know, I think he's made so many brilliant films, so it's interesting to see why, to know, understand why that is. And the film that he's made is quite, it's not really speaking to a black audience, it's speaking to another audience about reconsidering their um, prejudices. I, do, I think Black Klansman is not talking to black people, even though it's, it's veiled, it's hidden under this kind of um, umbrella yeah. of being a black film. So I think things have changed, maybe, but I don't, I don't know, I'll, I'll hand that over. I don't think it's changed in a way that, um, that much because the machine is still not been an earthquake okay no exactly yeah. <clears throat> i think there's still more to be done but it's not what about money from outside didn't mean to stop your no no it's fine midstream so no, to no, speak. Good, but good. i mean what about money from outside and big money we're talking china aren't we yeah um, yeah so the, that's changing hollywood yeah the chinese market is huge to the to the point where the studios feel like they can't they can't even ignore its rid ridiculous considerations like having to edit out like kind of homosexual scenes and stuff like that because they've become such a big bankroller for Hollywood now which is a strange place to be and I think indie films are always going to do their own thing but certainly with the with the really big movies they're going to be more and more kind of positioned with 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 the Chinese market in mind yeah I think and that's where you get sites like Netflix who are saying okay well we're going to take this risk um, they can afford to put things up on Netflix in different regions and they are going to fill that gap as Hollywood becomes maybe, I don't want to say held hostage, but held hostage a little bit to that financing. Netflix, Amazon Prime, other streaming services are going to be able to say, well, we don't necessarily need yeah, yeah. to do what they're asking of us, so we can kind of do our own thing. And I also think, speaking to all these other points, you have an audience that's much more vocal now than 20 years ago. We, people live tweet the Oscars all over the world. So you've got a, an audience that's much more participatory in, in every aspect of when a film comes to the cinema, when it is out on DVD, when it comes to award season. And I think the Oscars and Hollywood are maybe paying a little more attention to those audiences now than they may have had to 20 years ago. And I think that is part of a shift and causing the shift, but it's still got a long way to go, I think. Yeah, no, I was going to agree with that because I, 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 it's interesting that they will let themselves be held to ransom or held hostage to another territory. So it, it, it really exposes the fact that it's just about money. So it's, it's a bit of a shame that you, instead of reacting no, to slavery, isn't it? Yes. I mean, you know, it's sort of saying, you know, yes, of course we'll do whatever you want because you're the ones that are going to be paying our bills. Yeah, I think. And, yeah. But then you come around to the point that the Hollywood bills are much bigger. Well, yeah, and I think, uh, you know... It, Labour costs, for example. It pains me to say this, but I don't think people care about movies anymore. Um, and that's the big thing hanging over this conversation, is that TV has become so huge now. And that's where people really want to see their When stories. you say TV, you just mean the small screen, don't you? Because yes. we're talking about what you can watch on the train... Yeah, serialised content, yeah, I guess, okay. for a prosaic term. But, um, yeah, that's where all the growth is and where people are increasingly telling stories and people want to receive stories, you know, partly driven by attention span. And there just isn't the interest so much in film apart from these big occasional popcorny ones that people watch and then forget about and you can see that in the fact that the Oscars is facing like decreasing audiences and go on. No, no, I, was say, I don't think people are losing interest in film so much it's more I guess the experience around it and you're right with the attention span but if you could, it's accessibility as well I think going to the cinema it becomes a bit of a mm. chore if you think about budgets and location and you want it's to not have, cheap is it it's not cheap so i think that that but then people still go because even roma as beautiful as it is and watching it on a small screen seeing it in the cinema and i think it banked on that as well having its cinematic run it you need to see it on the screen i've heard so many people well, say alfonso Cuarón himself the director said go see, see this on, movie yeah, in the cinema you yeah. need which to is see it, has yeah. an irony to it really yeah. can, you help, can you help me here because if, if it's made by netflix and it's on their streaming service how would you go and see it in the it had a cinematic they run? Have, yeah. It and most and, and was, was that after it became successful? No, it was prior to. It was to. pre, yeah, it was during the kind of international film, film festival circuit. Right. Different regions had limited cinematic runs of So Roma. we're seeing different territories bleeding into different territories as well? In what sense? Well, in, in the sense that something that you might assume was purely cinematic and you had to go to a theatre to see it, um, such as a Hollywood movie, you can now see those 
on streaming services and some films that were made by a streaming services you can now see in a cinematic setting. Well, I, yeah, I think, I think so it's, it's all becoming perhaps. Well, I think technology is just kind of leveling the playing field a little. It's blurring those boundaries a little mm. bit. I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. Again, it speaks to access. You know, you've mm. got it, from a personal point of view, I think it's wonderful. Yes. Right. Yeah. 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 I, yeah. I agree. I think it's almost similar to like listening to a band on record and then going to see them live. I think we'll increasingly just see cinemas as like a place if you really if there's something you're really excited about you might if you can afford it go and see it there otherwise watch it at home and that's fine you know like I think but a lot of people and with something like Rome or I do think it's best seen on the big screen but there are so many films that it's fine if you want to watch them at home and if and if you can have a nice setup where you're able to watch on something bigger than this then great um, so it's not all, all doom and gloom in that sense there was an article in Vanity Fair um, which was all about the future of Hollywood which I happened to catch in which one Hollywood insider I think it was a producer said rather grandiosely, but nobody can do it like we can. Now, isn't that the last cry of the dinosaurs? Uh, yeah, it's a little bit, but I still think there is something in having, you know, the st people are still aspiring. The, the people that I work with and speak to are still aspiring to get to Hollywood, as it were, um, whichever country that is, wherever it's dominating and making film, people are still aspiring to get to that level. Hollywood still has its legend. It just has to not be so self-righteous and understand there are people, there are other ways that people can access this content and make their content. But we're ignoring YouTube at, the, at, at that point. YouTube is also has fed into this change in the industry because people are taking to the streets and doing their own thing. They're making their things off on their phones, putting it up on YouTube and becoming rich and famous or talented or getting hired into other places because they made something that was for a YouTube channel. So I think you've sort of half answered it within what you've just said. Hollywood has to change. It has because to change. Because it is self-righteous. I also yeah. think that calling Hollywood a dinosaur frames everything else as the asteroid. And I don't think that's quite the right analogy. Mm -hmm. I think all of these different technological platforms and diverse stories and the people who want to tell them have always been there. It's just a matter of giving those people access, access. to tell those stories. Mm -hmm. And now that's what's shifting. So it's not necessarily that here's Hollywood and here's everything else and it's colliding and destroying. It's that there's this organic kind of ecosystem that is changing and diversifying. And and that's is, a great is, is there room for everybody in this or are we going to see some great behemoth, whether it happens to be um, on the streaming service side, like Amazon or Netflix, buying out the Hollywood side of the business or the Hollywood side of the business buying out the streaming services and making them all into one great homogenous lump again or is there room for everybody? I can't ever see a world where art is monopolised, you know, and there's just one company controlling all the stories. So there might be a f there will, might be a few dominant ones, and that might include streaming services along with the Paramounts and the Universals. But I don't think we're going to see it become one big company. So we're going to have one big beast or several big beasts here, several big beasts here, and they're going to get along because they know that it's symbiotic, but at the same time they don't have to love each other. I think I think to an extent, yeah. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, is what I just said so ridiculous? No, no, because it's, it's just thinking about everyone being harmonious, harmoniously chugging along. But I think there's going to, obviously there's competition, there's threats, and there's going to be some pushing and pulling and nudging out of the way. Um, I can imagine there'd be, uh, Hollywood will come up with its, you know, all-encompassing entity, and but there will still be the others. And I think Amazon, Netflix, uh, and such, uh, and the other streaming platforms are going to be standalone beasts in their own right. OK, so, so we've had surprises from the, um, the streaming services, particularly with the, the speed with which they've done things and the, yeah. the success they've had. Are we going to see surprises from what we, for better word of a description, we will call Hollywood here. Are we going to see, be, see surprises from them? You know, I think yes. I'm Hopefully, yes. Um, you mm. do see major studios now signing on to, pl they're pledging to work with more women um, that's a, a big kind of movement that's just happened in the last couple of months. Um, so I think Hollywood, this kind of great behemoth that we're talking about, the golden you know, age of, of movies, um, are going to have to adapt. Um, and I think that will result in some, hopefully some nice surprises in terms of big budgets being thrown behind other diverse stories. I think that they will have to, to, to make up but there's always going to be people who want to go see Aquaman 2. And that's not a bad thing either. I haven't even seen Aquaman 1. <laughs> or maybe it's just called Aquaman. So, so if Hollywood has to rethink itself, where are the geniuses to do this? I mean, it's all happening at a grassroots level, I guess, right now. There's just like an opening up of, of the market. And I think that's why, I don't know, I, it's like an equal opportunity, not equal outcome. So the fact that everyone isn't perfectly represented in the best picture category, I think, is to kind of to be expected at the moment. Thank you very much for the conversation.
the Oscars still matter to some people. Absolutely. So pick your, your winner. Gosh. Best film. Oh, golly. Um, I, I, Black Panther's in there. Yeah. Um, and I would like it to win, to shake up, because it did shake up the industry and it, sh it made a big cultural impact. Okay, that's the uh, one you want and that's the one you I hope. But I do, I really, I haven't seen, I've seen almost all of them, but the favourite is, it's one that I wouldn't be upset if it won. Favourite's supposed to be rather feel good, isn't it? It is. I excuse love, the expression. Uh, I, it's feel, it's feel interesting, it's feel, I'd say. <laughs> yeah, weird say that. Fun feel weird and fun. Feel weird and fun, yeah. yeah. I, it's a tie for me between the favourite and Black Klansman, actually. I, I love that movie. Okay. Um, I think partially coming from a Jewish background, it was, that was an interesting element to see in that movie, yeah. how that interplay worked. It seems like Rome has got the, um, oh. the behind it now, the kind of the, the wind behind it. But I, I weirdly, I weirdly love *A Star Is Born* in its own way. Like I, I really admire *Roma* for what it is and the kind of achievement there. But I think *A Star Is Born* is just a really well done film as well and kind of a, yeah, and quite impressive. Listen, thank you all very, very much indeed. <laughs> thank you. And next time we should perhaps have a bigger conversation about the changing nature of diversity rather than Hollywood itself within within movies. We'd like to do that. Thank you for coming in. Thanks very much indeed for your company. Uh, we have arrived at Hollywood and it's time for us to say roll credits. Goodbye. <laughs>